responsible for directing the course of trade and contact with foreign lands. From the western outposts, missions of commerce and conversion spread out across the narrow seas to a jungle realm rich in gold and peoples thirsting for knowledge of the world and the forces that shaped it. From their eastern settlements, the Atlanteans sent forth missionaries, scholars, and traders to explore the lands within the Pillars of Hercules that bound the inland sea, across the desert kingdoms and beyond to the valleys of the Indus and Ganges. For many centuries, they did not lose sight of their majestic origins. Sincerity reigned in their heart. Moderation and prudence directed their conduct and dealings with foreign nations. They obeyed the laws and were religious adorers of the Atlantean gods, their ancestors. So long as they behaved in this manner, all was well with them. They were governed by the ordinances of the Atlantean rulers. Once in six years, they assembled to deliberate on public affairs, to examine all matters with pious attention, judging and condemning the wicked. But in the course of time, the vicissitudes of human affairs corrupted little by little their divine institutions. They hearkened to the prompting of rude ambition and sought to rule by violence. They commenced to study the arts of war, the ways of conquest and slavery and nothing else. They began to comport themselves like the rest of the children of men and grew depraved. Then Zeus, king of the gods, beholding this race once so noble, resolved to punish it. He convoked a council of the gods in Olympus and addressed them as follows. Here Plato's account ends, and it is believed that death interfered with its conclusion, just as death would now come to the continent and peoples of which he wrote. How exactly the demise of this once mighty realm occurred may never be known. There are those who speculate that she slipped beneath the waves in a single cataclysmic night, with the loss of more than 64 million lives. There are those who believe that within her final death throes, the true level of Atlantean development became terrifyingly clear. However the end came to fair Atlantis, we can be sure that in our own time, scant clues remain as to the existence and whereabouts of the remains of the Eighth Continent. There are several reasons uh, why I believe in the existence of Atlantis. Uh, they're put forward in some of these uh, uh, books which have made studies of Atlantis, such as Donnelly's book, uh, Charles Berlitz's book, uh, a Russian scientist named uh, Zirov, uh, many wonderful uh, collections of all the evidence which is available, which sort of points in a circumstantial way to the existence of Atlantis. I believe that Atlantis did exist, and if I had adequate funds, I would start out with the Azores and the Canaries and off the mouth of the Amazon, the Ilha de Maranjo. But then I would go down with the Alvin down the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. We have a volcano there called Atlantis dated 10,000 B.C. on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Those are the places that I would look. I think it's important that we look for Atlantis. Uh, just as Sleeman would not have found Troy if he had not looked for it. Unless you're seeking, you will certainly not find Atlantis. And if we do, it would probably be the most important archaeological event in the world. I think that the major task ahead of us is to look and see if we can find something. And the evidence will tell. It could be one of the most exciting discoveries of the 20th century. The Association for Research and Enlightenment in Virginia Beach dedicates a large amount of energy towards Atlantean studies. One of its scholars in this discipline is Dr. Doug Richards. Atlantis is a legend that's been around with us for a long time, since uh, several hundred years B.C., when Plato, in his dialogues Timaeus and Critias, first talked about Atlantis as being a continent beyond the pillars of Hercules that had a battle with the Athenians. Between Plato and the 1800s, there wasn't an awful lot done in terms of speculation on Atlantis. But then Ignatius Donnelly, in about 1882, published the book 
Atlantis the antediluvian world. And what Donnelly did was Donnelly compiled an enormous amount of material from different sciences and mythology to make the thesis that Atlantis had indeed existed and was the source of a lot of the world's civilization. Now, the reason that people are looking down in Bimini for Atlantis is because Edgar Cayce in the 1920s was giving psychic readings on a variety of topics and mentioned in one of the readings that Bimini, this tiny island off the coast of Florida, was the last remaining part above the waves of what was once a great continent, Atlantis. And in the succeeding 15 years, he mentioned Bimini in connection with Atlantis quite a few more times and dropped tantalizing hints about how one might go about finding it. For example, he said, if a geological survey were to be made in the Gulf Stream near Bimini, that much would be found. The Bimini group lie less than 50 miles from the Florida shore and consist of two main islands separated by a narrow channel. The population centers of Alice and Bailey towns cling to the sandy isthmus of North Bimini and have provided a safe and colorful haven for generations of boaters, deep sea fishermen, and would-be adventurers. Among its more famous or infamous part-time residents was writer Ernest Hemingway, a regular at the island's complete angler tavern. Somewhat more secluded and slow-paced, South Bimini, with resorts such as the Bimini Reef Club, caters almost exclusively to the new wave of undersea explorers. For some, the allure is simply that of a new adventure in a tropical paradise. For others, it's the opportunity to unravel one of the area's most enduring mysteries. It was from the shores of Bimini more than two decades ago that a previous generation of scuba diving enthusiasts commenced a search for clues which they hoped would ultimately correspond with and support Edgar Cayce's prophecy of Atlantis's rise. During the summer of 1968, ARE pilots Robert Brush and Trigg Adams were undertaking flyovers of the Bahamas in an attempt to find tangible proof of Edgar Cayce's predictions. The seafloor topography of the Bahama Banks is rife with evocative shapes and patterns, indistinct figures, shadowed footprints, and occasionally linear features. The various reports and sightings of the two pilots came to the attention of Miami-based archaeologist Dr. J. Manson Valentine, who was so intrigued by their observations that he embarked on a program of in-depth investigation so as to determine the likelihood of any of them being the remnants of man-made structures. On September 2nd of the same year, while searching for other reported sites off Bimini, Valentine found two anomalies half a mile off Paradise Point, North Bimini Island. Originally referred to as walls, the structures protruded roughly three feet above the seafloor and extended for 1,900 feet, 14 degrees off the beach line. Dr. Valentine saw an extensive pavement of rectangular and polygonal flat stones of varying sizes and thicknesses, obviously shaped and accurately aligned to form a convincingly man-made pattern. To the researchers, Casey's prediction had been realized, and so